Good evening, folks. This is Luke Grant speaking. How are you tonight? Great to have you here with us, joining us for our last Farminar of the Fall Farminar Series 2012. Very glad you're all here to join us and to listen to a great farmer, Tina Diffley. Uh, before we start, I wanted just to say a few things. Uh, purpose, past, and process is how we do things at Practical Farms of Iowa, the purpose of why we're here. Uh, we're all here to learn together and share our knowledge with each other and hopefully uh, improve our farms and lives in, in ways we we can, we can take with us the rest of our lives. Uh, we'd like to think of our Farm in Our series as our online field day se season. Field days are a great way to get together with farmers across the state. We do about 30 field days a year. And here's a photo from one up in northwest Iowa last summer. Uh, so guys are coming together tonight to uh, think about uh, there's, you know, might be 20, 20 30 people here tonight uh, who, who are at their own farms across the state, maybe around the Midwest. And they're, they want to be part of your, your network of support, and maybe they can share some ideas with you, too. So feel free to get in touch with folks that, uh, that interest you in the chat box dialog, and let us know, too, in our, in our email evaluation we'll send out. Uh, let us know how we can improve and help you network better and help you learn, learn more from new, new farmers. Maybe you have some, some topic suggestions or some speaker suggestions. We'd be glad to uh, take, take your feedback and incorporate that work, uh, that, that idea into our work. Uh, this, we've come to the end of our fall series now. We've had a great run so far this year, a lot of great speakers and topics. We've got all, all those are, uh, recorded, so you can, you can download a podcast of these. All these audio uh, are available for podcast download at our Practical Farmers of Iowa website. And you can also watch uh, the flash video of all the, the different things going on in the share screens you see, and that's also available on our website too. So you've got lots of options to still enjoy the good work that's been done uh, this fall. And do join us for next winter. We've got a whole new series scheduled for January and February, including two special Thursday noon farminars during January. Uh, we're hoping to help ex expand the opportunities of learning uh, beyond uh, what we've done in the past because we've just seen so much great uh, interest from folks like you attending and, and, and keeping us focused on, uh, on the topics that are highest priority to you. So thank you very much for all the folks that have helped us so far and, and continue to help us direct our programming at Practical Farmers of Iowa. We really like to let farmers be the experts and uh, let, let farmers share their voices and experiences because our, our farmers have told us uh, for over 28 years now that the best way to learn uh, about farming is uh, to by talking with other farmers who are, who are living, it, um, living it every day. Uh, and so that's what we try to do. Here's a photo from Kate Edwards, her field day last summer, beginning farmer in eastern Iowa. Uh, and we also like to try to really cover a diverse uh, array of programming for all kinds of audiences and all kinds of uh, enterprises. So you're not just going to find one thing at Practical Farmers of Iowa. You're going to find, hopefully, a little bit of everything. And we really like to try to feature all, all kinds of perspectives and people at every level. You know, we've got beginning farmers that are presenters. We've got experienced farmers that are present presenters. And... We think that's a great way to help uh, share the ideas and, and always keep keep invigorated with new new ways of doing things and, and also learning some things, uh, sharing some things we've already learned so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that being said, I just encourage all, all you folks to, to join Practical Farmers of Iowa. We're a membership nonprofit organization, and so our strength really relies on our members. Uh, we And we are very proud to say that we've got about 2,000 individuals now as members of Practical Farmers of Iowa. And we're hoping to have a thousand memberships. Uh, we have lots of different members um, who are on, under one membership. You know, so if you have a whole farm membership, you could have five, seven, ten people on that one membership. So there's a lot of great opportunities to get involved and, and get, get get some more knowledge sharing from farmers by being a member. So please keep that in mind as an opportunity to really invest in your future. Keep up with us on Facebook in the meantime. Make sure to like us on Facebook, and you can get some great updates for different opportunities that come your way. Finally, our, our probably our premier event of the whole year, we have about 100 events a year, but the premier one is our annual conference. It's a three-day event. You can learn from farmers. It's based in Ames, Iowa at the Sheeman Building, and we've got some really great speakers lined up. Greg Judy from Missouri is going to come, come up, and we've got uh, Elaine Ingham from Ohio and the Rodale Institute. She's going to share her experience with compost for everybody at a short course on Thursday, the 10th. We've got a whole day of short courses on the 10th. And then uh, our regular conference programming is Friday and Saturday. You can register online, and the discounts for registrations ends January 2nd. So make sure you get your registration in. 
to save a bundle of money on a discounted registration. This is really the, the premier, uh, the best value you can find out there, I think, for sustainable agriculture uh, conference fees. Just $20 if you're a student, or $70 as a PFI member for two full days of programming. And if you want to help support the youth program so we can always help the youngsters coming along, the next generation, uh, you could definitely bring an, island, uh, bring an item for silent auction donation. We have a silent auction that goes on during the conference, and that's a great way to help, uh, you know, maybe if you're good with needlework, you could bring a handmade gift and put that on for silent auction, or maybe if you uh, do some jams and jellies or other pres pres preserved uh, goods, it would be really great if you could donate that item to our annual conference silent auction and we can help raise about $2,000 for our youth program. So please do donate. We've got 32 items donated so far, and our, our uh, record has been about 50 items. So if we can just get a few more, we could break our record. And just email me with your item and starting bid, and we'll be sure to save a spot for you on the annual or the assignment auction table. This, was, this photo here is one of a, a handiwork of one of the items that's going to be at silent auction, that someone did some needlework there and made a homemade uh, wall hanging out of uh, fabric. Anywho, that's enough for me, and tonight we're going to visit with Tina, Di Tina Diffley, and I think I'll bring up her slides here, and be really, it'd be really great to have you all just be really engaged and uh, ask questions throughout, uh, and, and be, be, be feel free to interrupt uh, Tina if you, if you need to check for understanding for something or whatnot, so without any more, I'll just uh, send it over to Tina. Hi, this is Tina. Well, Sounds when I good. talk about marketing, I really like to start out by talking about the three components of a farm. From my perspective, I looked it up once in a dictionary, the definition of what is a farm. And it said, a tract of land suitable for agricultural purposes. To me, that just wasn't real at all. And when I started to really ask myself, well, what, well, what is a farm? I really came to the understanding that a farm is a synthesis of the business, the land, and the people. And those three components all bring their unique components to that synthesis so that every farm really has to build itself upon those components. The business will bring the topography, the soil types, the weather that it exists within. The people bring their strengths and their skills. The business will bring what the local community values. So when I talk about marketing, I really want to emphasize that the market that's right for one person won't necessarily be right for another, and that one really has to find that right market for that particular farm. This next slide, I'd like to really talk about how this is part of that matching your farm to your strengths. Because there's a lot of different markets out there, and a market that might be perfect for one person may not be good at all for the next person. If you look on the left of this slide, where it says gross income per product unit, now this shows how the gross income per product unit goes up as you go up this list of different markets, from sale to broker to sale to wholesaler, retailers, institutions, all the way up. So your product unit will go up. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be more profitable. And it's just really important to match, again, that farm, that right market. If you're selling low on the bottom there, sales to brokers, sales to wholesale, it's going to take a lot more land to be profitable. It's going to take high-level production skills. These are easier to train skills, for example, than um, people skills and marketing skills. As you go up that arrow into, like, direct end user type markets, special occasion, special need type markets, those require much more marketing skills and people skills. Those are harder to train skills. So this just is a one way of looking at some of these questions about matching those markets. It's important to think about the fact that you're selling more than just fresh produce. There's a lot of value addition that can be attached to produce. So I'm making the assumption that many of you are smaller farms, and if that's not true, you can holler over there in the chat box. But if you are a smaller farm, or even a mid-sized farm, 
can be very important to really recognize what value additions your customers value and will pay a premium for. If you don't have some form of value addition, you become trapped in a commodity or a national price kind of um, yo-yo game where you are forced to, to sell at that price. I'm going to show you some of those prices later. When we talk about value additions, something like local or organic, those are value additions if the customer values them. Um, a family farm is of value to some people, to other people they don't care. These name branding your farm, unit packaging, I'm going to show you some of these um, ideas as we go along in photos, labeling, something like delivery and service and quality, those are also value additions. And when I say that, it really all relates to who is your customer and what are they looking for. If I think back to the 70s when Martin started our farm, organic at that point in time did not have any value. It did not receive a premium. Local also did not have a value. Imported was what was cool. That was the buzzword. Something was imported. It was gourmet. So that has really changed since then. In the 70s, there was no premium for organic or local. That didn't mean we didn't practice that. We did practice organic, we did practice local, and we had to educate our customers and bring them up to a point where they recognized the value of those things and would then pay a premium. So as you're looking at that produce and you're asking yourself, what values can I add there that can really help you in your market um, maximize that premium? So for Martin and I, this is right back to what is your farm, what are, what are those components of your land, of your market, and your people. We were a production-oriented farm. We had 100 acres of land, 72 of them were tillable, and we had about 45 in production at an average time. This meant that we could produce volume and service a wholesale market. We predominantly sold wholesale to retailers, and then we also had a roadside stand. But for us, at our size and scale and the level of mechanization that we had, we could put a few tractors and we could mechanize the weed management and the planting. The harvest had to be done by hand. We could service those markets and do very well. So those were the sweet spots for us. We could have received a higher gross income per product unit, perhaps, if we had sold to, say, maybe wholesale to a restaurant, but we wouldn't have probably made as much money. For us, the question isn't what's the gross income, but what's the net income? I'll walk you through some of the thoughts on that. I put this slide in here to talk a little bit about gross incomes per acre. Oh. I'm seeing that. Okay, is this a little better on the volume? I forgot to look over there. Turn it up a little bit. Is that better? So the gross I'll try talking louder and you can tell me if that's better. I put these dollars in here because it's important if you're a small farm to think about gross incomes per acre. They aren't the end all answer and I don't want you to put too much attention into them, but it can be helpful in looking about um, different markets. These are numbers that we grossed in 2008 per acre and you can see they're really variable. The winter squash is six to nine thousand per acre as a gross income, sweet corn similar. And then you look down and you see tomatoes at forty to eighty thousand dollars an acre. That's a really big difference. Or kale at fifty and broccoli at twelve. These are that's really different um, values. And it's important to think about them if you have a very small amount of land. You really have to grow the high value per acre crops to even begin to come out. Because we had an economy of scale. For us, sweet corn was actually a profitable crop. We could mechanize the planting and the care. We didn't have very much of an input or money up front into a crop like sweet corn or winter squash before we came to harvest. 
and most of our cost of production really was in the harvest. Where a crop like tomatoes, which might look so profitable there, they were a high risk crop. They had a lot of risk as far as disease potential and a lot of uh, money invested up front before we even harvested them. So there you have to be able to make a higher gross per income per acre. If you're a small farm, five acres or less, then these numbers become very important that you're growing high value crops. If you have a larger farm and you can mechanize things and make your scale of economy work, then some of those lower value crops can be very, very profitable. This cost of production tool is from Iowa State. And I really encourage you to know your cost of production. This example here is from a wholesale success manual. And I didn't put the whole thing online, just the top and the bottom. So what I really want to show you here is you look at step one, the units produced per pound. What they're doing here is they're comparing current production on a small farm where they're only producing 1,600 one pound units of potatoes. And then they're doing a hypothetical expanded production of 320,000 pounds, and going from 0.1 acre to 20 acres, and running out numbers just to see how the products, the crop compares as far as an enterprise budget. In this middle section, step two, you can see that they're comparing the prices if they sold them direct at a wholesale at 45 cents per pound compared to a farmer's market at $2 a pound, and they cost that out. And you start to see that the, the smaller volume of 0.1 acre would only gross 3,200 compared to 144,000 on the larger production. But the important thing that we really want to find out is the net, net uh, gain. So step three, which I didn't include here, shows you all of the expenses. And then we go down to step four, and you can see the return after cost, comparing the profit at $2,434 compared to $66,952. So it gives an example of how having a higher volume, if it's mechanized, can be um, much more profitable for the farmer. But of course, this is only going to work if you have sufficient production and sufficient land to do that. So it's really important as much as possible. Oh, here's someone asked me about the cost risk on tomatoes changing with tunnels. I am not experienced with high tunnels. I have grown tomatoes by putting them in um, early row tunnels to get them earlier. So I can't really comment on high tunnels. So as we look at all these values that you can add, if you can avoid being a price taker, as long as you're growing a commodity crop and everyone has the same thing that you have, you're in that position of being a price taker. I put these prices in here on spinach from 2008. And the prices themselves are, are irrelevant for what I want to talk about. What's relevant is how variable they are. You can see in January, spinach organic was $40. In April, it was $45. In October, it was $54. In December, it was $28. If you're forced to play that uh, national price game, it's very difficult to be economically viable. So it's, if you can develop your markets where you have control over the price, that's going to be a lot um, more uh, viable for you in the long run. So setting prices can be really challenging. And there's different strategies. For Martin and I, our your, our demarketing strategy was that we wanted to keep our customer completely satisfied for the entire production season. We wanted to come in as early as possible 
and go as late as possible into the season and never ever have a production gap. When you're selling wholesale to a retailer, to an institution or a restaurant, any market where people are going to get to where they're really counting on you for a certain product, it's very important they have consistent product or otherwise they they don't stay in the market. It's hard to catch them if you come in and then go back out. So having consistent quality product is a really important strategy for Martin and I. And we would produce that consistent product by having um, a surplus. We would every year when we plan how much we were going to need for the coming season, we would actually add 15 percent on to that total so that we would be sure we had enough. Now this is a really different strategy than someone might farm with that has smaller acreage. There was a farm north of the Twin Cities who had somewhat of an opposite strategy, which was they had a small acreage. So their pricing strategy was that they would grow less than the demand and then control the volume of their demand by raising their price. So our strategy was to come in at this steady national, local, fair local price that become established. We come in as early as we could and hold that price for the entire season and go as late as we could. Whereas this other grower would actually come in at a higher price and reduce his demand to increase, uh, it raises price to reduce his demand. So you really have to ask what the market will bear when you're looking at prices. You, you have the national price, which if you are working with an account or if you're selling at a farmer's market, you might be looking at a local price. Those are going to be sort of a starting point for many people. And to get them to come to a point where they will pay more consistently for your product and pay for a premium, you really have to know who that customer is and what they value. What are you going to give them that is worth more to them. We looked at some of those values earlier, whether it was an organic product or a local product, or whether you're going to bring the top quality possible. You Knowing what that customer values is going to have a big effect on how much more you can or cannot charge for that product. And again, you have to know your cost of production. Iowa State has some really great enterprise budget tools on their website that are really useful for helping you figure out your cost of production. This can be really hard for small farmers because they may have many different crops, really diverse crops, and it can be hard to figure out for each crop what their cost of production is. I have never ever kept track of each crop exactly my labor hours. The way I figure them out is to do an estimate. It takes, for example, a worker five boxes per hour. They can pick five boxes of broccoli per hour. So I know what it costs to pick, pay that worker. I can figure out the harvest cost, for example, and the carton cost. So I can pretty much estimate and get pretty accurate at my cost of production. Once you've done that, it's often very surprising to find that the cost is often very different than people realize and they may be charging not enough. There's a real great value to having a steady price, to coming in at one price and hold it consistently. So all this will help you be less fungible. And this is one of my favorite words when I'm talking about marketing, because fungible means freely exchangeable or replaceable for another of like nature or kind. And as long as you are just growing what everyone else is growing and haven't placed some kind of value on it, whether it's quality or, or consistency, it can be hard to um, not be fungible. When you're selling at a farmer's market, that is very difficult because it's a very competitive market. And oftentimes, everyone has the exact same price, and they just want to get rid of it. And someone will always be selling for less. If I was selling at a farmer's market, I would look, I find like I myself in the markets that I'm in have found that farmer's markets are great for beginners or great for someone who doesn't 
have enough product or consistency to maintain a wholesale account, a roadside stand. Once we were able to move into our own roadside stand, we stopped selling the farmer's markets because of this problem with everyone having the same thing and being really competitive. So at our roadside stand, we were able to maintain our own prices and charge a good price and have a really steady supply. At our roadside stand, one of the values that we were able to add is that we really had this opportunity to tell people our story. And that story was really based on our values, which added value to our product. We could really put those customers in touch with the farming side of business, and they really wanted that. So they came to the stand for a large reason, because they really wanted that relationship. Branding your name can be a really important way of adding value. It can really relate your product or your reputation or location to be part of that name. Our roadside stand was on our farm originally, and then that farm was developed, and so we moved to a new farm but kept our roadside stand at the old location. The trick about a roadside stand is you need really good location. If you're isolated, um, not near a good population, or not on a main road, it can be pretty hard to pull people to a stand unless you have something really key, like a pick your own strawberry, or something that people are really going to go out of their way to come to. Branding your product can really be helpful because it can bring people to a point where they're asking for it by name. You want something that's memorable, that people can spell, that they can find it. Think about how it makes people feel, what you want to say to them. And you want the image to be relative to whatever that market is. Uh, at, we were using a number of tools to help us brand our product in our market. When we sold to wholesale, we used these point of purchase price cards and they had a picture of us in the field. And that was extremely effective because the customers saw us so many times. Every time they bought produce, they saw a picture of us in a different field. They actually would forget they'd never met us. They felt so familiar to us. They'd seen us so many times. Those point of purchase cards brought a lot of um, image and relationship and an understanding of who we were. They really planted our name in customers' minds. So much of buying food is habitual, and people need to get a habit of knowing who they're going to be buying it from. If you're wholesaling, try to find buyers who will help you promote your brand that will use your point of purchase materials and make it really easy for them. Um, when I, we made these signs, we actually went to each of our stores, and they had different display racks. So we would make a sign specific to their size display, and we would laminate them so they're waterproof. That was really helpful for our stores. We made it easy for them to use them. You can see on the bottom, we had a twist tie with our name on it. The more times the customer can see your name and get familiar with who you are, it's going to be really helpful. At our roadside stand, we used these um, different pictures than we did in the store. On the bottom left of this slide, you can see these vegetable images that my son drew. They were too funky looking for in our store, but they're perfect for our roadside stand. Whereas if I would have used these point of purchase signs that I used in the store at our stand, they just didn't look right there. They looked too formal. This was a sign that we used for our sweet corn crop, and the stores would place it up beforehand before the crop came in, and they would write in the little bubble whatever I told them was going on in the field whether it was that first silk was ready or how soon it would be in. And this was really effective because the people really got to know our farm. And by the time the corn was ripe, they were really ready in line, ready to get it. So think about also what you can grow as a signature crop. For our farm, sweet corn was a signature crop as well as melons. And they're often a crop that you really focus on and specialize in. And that buyer comes to think of you as the corn guy or the melon guy. And then you're in that store. You can be tacking on other products along with it. You can 
at our roadside fan, sweet corn was what we used to stop the cars. We wouldn't have been able to stop them to buy kale, for example, or broccoli. But then once they were stopped, we gave them a full service opportunity to purchase other products. So whatever you, whatever your name is, make sure that you really are telling that story, the same story, through everything that you do, whether it's how your delivery person looks, if you're at a roadside stand, how your, your salesperson there looks, how they talk to people, your label, your quality, your pack. I put this picture in on the right as a very simple example of the way you pack a box says so much about who you are and what your quality is. If you have a box that's nicely arranged and the fruit is laid out, it looks like you really cared and that will carry over to people's impression of you. I like what Kathy just said here, the one who has a first tends to develop customer loyalty. Coming in really early can be really an important strategy. And then everything that you do, you want to just be sending that same message of what is your story. This is an example of an advertisement that we had in the Twin Cities, and it told many parts of our story. It has our signature crop on there. It talks about how close we are, 37 minutes from the wedge. That talked a lot about how local we are, how fresh we are. If we make all the lights, gave a great little um, relational ship kind of feeling. This kind of marketing really helped reduce that distance between the farmer and the user. They really felt, um, like they knew who we were. And build those relationships with everyone, not just the buyer, but everyone who handles your produce, whether you're selling direct at a farmer's market or to a wholesaler or to a restaurant, whether it's the person who's receiving, it all can make a really big difference. So I talked a little bit about knowing who you're selling to and why they buy. It's really important to understand why they're buying. This little chart I put on here, I made this in 1991 when we had lost our first farm to development and I really was taking a look at our different markets. And it was very helpful to me because I could see how at my roadside stand, not that many of my customers cared that it was organic. At my wholesale co-op accounts there, the product had to be organic or I simply couldn't have sold it. So understanding each of these various um, reasons a person is buying was really helpful to me. I could educate people about organic or some of these values, and I could bring them up to where they valued it. But what I could charge and how I marketed and how I packaged the product was really affected by what I knew that they valued. So I encourage people to look at something that I call competitive advantage. And this word competitive doesn't mean competitive in the sense of uh, beating up someone else in the market. It actually means the opposite. So think of competitive advantage as how you are different and better than your peers. And if you think about, if you think of the whole movement that we're trying to create of a local food system and every person that's involved in it, whether it's the distributors or the retailers or the farmers, and each having their role. If each of those people in that role does their work from what their strengths are, it goes right back to what is a farm and the synthesis of the land, the people in the business. By really working from your areas of strengths, things that you can do best, whether it's the type of soil you have, or whether you're mechanized or very small, or what um, your marketing skills might be. There's a lot of ways you can look at what you can do different and best. If you focus your farm in those areas, it will be that much easier for you to succeed. When we look at our farm here, we found what kind of soil we had and what type of crops would grow best on that. That just brought us that much closer to success if we were growing the crops that we would do naturally well at. We were mechanized and we had sufficient acreage, so crops like sweet corn and broccoli, which weren't high dollar per acre, were great crops for us because they could be mechanized 
and they actually had good net returns when they were in a mechanical system. Um, we had a really direct relationship with our retailers. We were close to the urban edge so we could get into our markets very quickly. So these are all ways that you can look at um, how you can really maximize what you can do the best. You see the question of packaging. I have some pictures later I'll show you on them. And as you think about this concept, I encourage you to think of the imported product as the competition and not that local farmer. Someone asked earlier about when the prices are so competitive at the farmer's market and people just want to get rid of it. It's so important that before you plant anything, you have a clear plan about what the market is going to be. People that don't have a clear plan and know where it's going to be sold, once that market, once the product comes in and they're facing the field of it, if they don't have a plan, often exactly that happens. They just drop the price and no one makes any money. So if you can really try to develop systems where your neighbor is your ally and you're not necessarily competing with each other cutthroat and you each have your own story and your own role in that market, it expands the entire market and makes it more successful for everyone. So let's just talk about trends a little bit because this can be really helpful in making decisions about what to grow. And, you know, a trend is something in which it's going to increase. Organic is a trend. Local is a trend. That's only going to continue to grow. Whereas a fad is something that is taken up with enthusiasm and not continued. So when I try to decide what's going to happen with something, one of the questions I ask is, does it have a characteristic beyond being novel? Is it more tender or sweet, some unique taste? Is it more convenient or nutritious? If it doesn't, if it's really just novel, it's not going to be novel once people have eaten it. Purple potatoes would be an example. They're fun. You know, to see a purple potato, that's really exciting if you've never seen one. I myself don't think they particularly taste better. Um, whereas a Yukon Gold, I think, does taste better. And so when the purple potatoes came into the market, they were fun for a little bit, but they never really took off as a main crop, whereas Yukon Golds really did take off. Lacinato kale would be another example. That came in in 1997, and the first time we tasted it, it was so tender and so sweet. It was absolutely a better kale than the green. So we felt really confident that it would take um, off and be better than the green kale, and that is indeed what happened. So when you're evaluating products, you're trying to figure out what place they'll have in the market, that can be a good question to ask. It can still be a good product to grow, just because it doesn't become a main product doesn't mean it's not the greatest product to grow, but it'll give you some sense of volume. Where do I see small-scale farming in 10 years? I think small-scale farming is going to continue to be very popular for the customers. I think many of the small-scale farmers are going to find that it's a very difficult scale to be economically viable. Um, under 10 acres, to make it work on under 10 acres, you've got to really maximize your income per acre and have a market that will support value added. Or you have to really keep your um, cost of production very, very tight. So I think that a lot of the smaller farms will find ways to either really add value to their product or they will scale up to a size that allows them to make more of the profit um, volume. When I looked at some of these past decisions we made, salad mix, for example, when it came in in 1987, it was really high. It was about $17, $18 a pound. And within six months, almost every farm magazine had run an article that said make 150,000 an acre in one year. And I looked at it and I said, boy, in two years, 
Potomac is going to really not have much value. And it didn't take long, and now it's about $6 a pound. So I was glad that we made that decision not to go into salad mix. It's a hard crop to grow at a small scale without mechanization and keep it profitable. When I looked at heirloom tomatoes when they came in, that was an interesting decision for us because at that point in time, we were growing, the, we were the main tomato supplier for our stores. We had a beefsteak and a cherry tomato and an Italian tomato. So whatever type of tomato the customer might want, they would end up purchasing one of ours. When heirloom tomatoes came along, we looked at them and we recognized that they would probably do well and that people would want them. And that if we didn't grow them, someone else would, and then that would reduce our sales of the tomatoes that we were growing. So we looked at heirlooms pretty closely, and we decided not to grow them, that they didn't really fit into our marketing plan, into our soil types, and into our system. And we made that conscious choice that we wouldn't grow them knowing that someone else probably would, and that we would then reduce our other tomato sales, and that we would adjust the farm system accordingly. So if you can find ways of selling those features, for example, that this lacinato kale is more tender rather than I have lacinato kale for sale, each of those features has benefits that your customer can value. This can be very positive. Look at different cultivars. Make sure that matches your customer. We would grow a large watermelon for our um, cost-sensitive customers. That would be a cheaper watermelon. And then we grew specialty melons, the yellow and the orange and the smaller icebox melons. And those were more expensive. And they would satisfy the needs of those um, customers. But it's just really important that these cultivars are matching who your customers are. This picture of this very large watermelon, that's going to be a very hard sell unless you are in a community with a very large family. They might be fun, and you might find that if you have a farmer's market or roadside stand that attracts people to come over to you, but it'll be a hard thing to sell. Now, that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to just grow what people demand. The seedless watermelon is a good example of that, in that the mainstream market now is all about seedless watermelon. I don't want to grow seedless watermelon. They're very sensitive to disease, fungal diseases. I'm an organic farmer. Why would I want to grow a crop that's going to be more sensitive? I also don't believe they taste as good. So instead of just going along with the market and growing a seedless watermelon because that's what everyone else was growing, we went to our buyers and we explained to them why we didn't want to grow them, their sensitivity issues, and they agreed. And so they support our seeded melons. As you look at these crops and your market, it's really important that you have strong diversity. But the diversity has to be the right type of diversity. If you just grow a lot of crops, but they're not properly planned, they won't really save you as far as that self-insurance. You want to think about how well adapted they are to your climate and soils. If they aren't well adapted to your climate and soils, and then they become high-risk crops. That really isn't much of a self-insurance type of thinking. You do want to have a number of crop families, but you also want to think about when they come into the market, whether it's spring, summer, or fall, whether it's cool season or hot season crops, how secure the market is for those particular crops, how many you can really count on, how many different types of customers you have. This all really adds up to diversity that's going to make you a lot um, less saleable. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about sequential planting because it's a really an important part of managing a market. I talked a little earlier about how satisfying your customer from as early as possible through the season and as late as possible is really important for keeping them satisfied. If you come in and out, when you don't have it, they're going to look elsewhere. And then when you come back with it, it's going to be harder to get back into the market. I recommend for most farmers that they're generally better off having a few less crops and doing them really well and really consistently than 
trying to just grow absolutely everything. So I want to show you how we sequence a crop like cucumbers or zucchini would also work this well this way. These are crops that don't produce consistently. They tend to come in um, slowly and then come into a stronger peak and then drop off and move their production up and down. So if consistent product is desired, then there has to be some other mechanism to make that happen. So this is how we do it on our farm with cucumbers. They actually bear fruit for about five weeks, but our experience is that after three weeks, the production quality drops and we don't necessarily want to pick them anymore. It's not economically viable. There's too many that aren't of quality and we're gonna be throwing them out. So we only plan to pick them for three weeks. We might pick them longer if we need the product, but it's not the plan when we sit down and do our winter planning. So we overlap them. Even though harvest is expected to last for 21 days, we plant every 10 days. And if you look at, for example, this red line, start with the third one in, you'll see that the production comes up and then drops and then goes back up and then drops off. And if you move over to the green line planted 10 days later, you see how by alternating when they're planted, you get the peak at a different time and it adds up into a steady production volume. We start our very first planting at a double planting because when people first start buying them in early summer, they're very hungry for them and they sell much stronger. So we need more on that early production. And then the second and third and fourth plantings, we drop the volume off. So that's like the lower volume. So this orange line on the very top, you're seeing what our overall production is and how we can then keep it very steady. For a crop like broccoli, we actually plant um, 19 different times in a growing season, once a week. And our goal, again, is to have a very consistent product. We come in around June 15th, June 20th, and can last all the way into the November, depending on when it's cold. So when we do this sort of thing, planning, we start uh, on the far right. And we write down the date we expect it to mature. And you can see how these later plantings, it's going to be colder out when they come in in October rather than summer. The summer plantings, we can pick a planting of broccoli out in seven days. Everything is in, picked, and done. And we're moving to the next planting. When we get into these later plantings, if you go down to the bottom, you'll see the crop that came in October 20th. It's going to take 20 days for that all to mature because it's cold out. So we're going to need to plant a higher amount of broccoli plants to satisfy that as they mature slower. And also people will eat more of it in fall. So you can see that we're planting much more broccoli to satisfy those fall markets than we are in the summer markets. The first, second, and third planting, you can see we only planted 4,000 plants. So that should give you some sense of how we sequence a crop like broccoli. Corn would be sequenced a similar way. So it's just super important, I want to emphasize this one more time, that you really plan before you plant. If something is new, whether it's a new product or a new market, start out small, keep your risks at a really low level before you have experience. You know, even after I had 20 years of experience, if we started a new crop, or we would just experiment with it the first year. And we always had our, our mainstream cultivars that we really could depend on, and we would always experiment with other cultivars at a small volume, just so that we really would know what the cultivars are all each like on our farm, because it's different. If you're selling to a wholesale market, whether it's a restaurant buyer or an institution or a wholesaler or a retailer, it's very important that you meet with those buyers in the off season. Talk to them about what products and volumes they need what type of packaging and pack out they're going to need so that you're sure to meet their, su their supplies. Ask them the best way to communicate. Um, is there any way we can have security when planning? We sat down and planned with buyers before only if we undercut the farms who are certified organics and we are in transition. So that is an important question. 
when you sat down with those buyers, it's very important that you know if they're going to require certification or not. That's one of the things that I would want to put on my contract. I'm going to talk about contracts in a minute. Maybe I should answer that question then. When you're talking with these buyers, find out the best way to communicate. If they want you to call or send an email, what the best time and day is for ordering. There's nothing worse than calling a retail store for an order that opens at 9 o'clock. If you call them at 5 to 9, then they're super busy. So really have a sense of what their needs are and how you can serve their needs rather than expecting them to serve yours. That can really help you. Sometimes you have to prove yourself. Um, if they don't know you or they have an attitude, the first time I ever sold the Whole Foods, it was 1995 when they opened the St. Paul store, and the buyer really had an attitude about local product. He didn't want to buy local product. He was certain that it wouldn't be properly post-harvest handled and cooled and that it wouldn't last. And he flat out told me he had no intention of buying any local. And I just said to him, tell you what, I'll ship you $500 worth of product, and you don't have to pay for it unless you want to order more. And it worked. He, he bought it. I sent it in. He loved it. He sent a check and continued to buy. So sometimes you have to do something to really get them their attention or bring in a box. It doesn't have to be a full palette, but something that you can show them you do know what you're doing. And make sure you really understand what their needs are. If you can provide them with um, a product availability chart where you're really showing them what you're going to have and when and what the price is going to be, that can be very, very helpful. Should you write a contract? If, if I want to supply a farmer um, an account and I want to be able to count on them, I want a contract. If I was experimenting or I was going to be offering someone surplus, I might not want to make a commitment, then I wouldn't want the contract. Sometimes so you don't want to promise more than you know you can deliver. I think this is very important for beginning farmers. If you haven't farmed long enough yet to have systems down, that you're going to have a reliable product line. I think it would be wise to not sign a contract because you don't want to make promises that you can't keep and then affect how they are going to perceive you later down, down the road once you are really ready to deliver the goods. If the buyer doesn't want to write a contract, it's still really important to write down everything that you've discussed and show it to them. Make sure you have a mutual understanding. Things that should be included in a contract would be if they have requirements that you are certified, what their level of commitment is. The contracts that I wrote, I never expected them to be legally binding contracts. That was not my goal. My goal was a document that was a clear understanding that we had between us. It was very useful, for example, if the buyer I was working with left the store and I had to work with a new buyer. I could go in with that contract and show it to them and say, you know, we've been selling to you for X number of years and this is the agreement we wrote last winter and that really made that transition easier. We would, what we wrote in our contracts was we showed them a spreadsheet of what they had purchased the year before and the contract itself said that we would be their main supplier of those listed items during our product availability. We didn't list an amount that we expected them to buy. We just listed that we would be member, their main supplier if we had that, so that it was a commitment. I wouldn't, in answer to this question of how can you write a contract and take into account the unpredictable weather, I would never ever sign a contract that was a performance contract requiring me to bring the product in whether or not I had it. So all of my contracts have always included um, an act of God clause that if I lost my crop to the weather, I, I didn't have to bring it in. But by having a contract, you have they have made a commitment to purchase from you, and it's in writing. And even if it's not going to be 
something that you would enforce in a legal situation if they didn't follow it. The simple act of putting it in writing takes seriousness on their part, and they have to really think about that before they sign it. So you have them already really um, committed, and that can be very helpful. Let's talk a little bit about packing standards and grades, because depending on your market, this will be more or less important. But the first rule of thumb is in sorting that nothing that is rotten or diseased or damaged or bruised really isn't, doesn't belong in any grade, whether you're selling at a farmer's market or a roadside stand or a wholesale account. Those products really need to be kept out. There's food safety issues involved with them. They aren't going to keep. They're going to really affect your reputation if you send them. So the very first question you ask when you're sorting produce is if it's damaged or diseased. And then if it is, I really recommend you don't put it in any sort account. When you look at seconds and you're sorting seconds, what a second is is cosmetically imperfect. And I want to really emphasize this because I often see boxes packed with produce that is damaged and people are listing on the label that there's seconds. A second means it's cosmetically imperfect. So that means that you expect it to keep equally long, but it may be too big. It might be a second because it's non-uniformly shaped or it may be an unusual size or it may have a scar. When I look at a, a, a produce item and I try to decide if it's a second or a first, I look at it as a whole. So if it has a small tiny scar but as a whole it's very nicely shaped and in good, you know, good attractiveness, I would call it a first. If the scars are such that it's visually unappealing, but it's still sound and not damaged, then it might be considered a second. This picture, I took this picture in a local co-op. There were small kohlrabis there. They should not have been packed to a grocery store. They shouldn't have been packed or sold anywhere. They're really inferior quality and should have been left in the field. And when those are shipped or put out, even if you have that real nice one next to them, they affect the image of the entire product and people really will have a hard time um, purchasing it. There are markets that will purchase seconds. Um, some restaurants will, some institutions. Again, they're expecting them not to be damaged, but to just be a cosmetic imperfection. At our roadside stand, we could sell seconds for um, canning and for salsa or for freezing. They're very popular. They're great for value added. Here's an example of a sweet potato second. It's actually from Tabletop Farm. And this wouldn't go into a grocery store's box, but it could be sold to a buyer that knows it's going to be a second. There isn't anything about that sweet potato necessarily that I can see that's going to cause it to spoil. It's a cosmetic imperfection. Be sure you know the quality on the inside, this cabbage looks perfectly fine on the outside, but it's bad on the inside, so that should not be shipped. This tomato example has anthracnose, might look just fine when you ship it and then break down the next day. So you really want to think of those customers as long-term assets, and it's not today's sale that matters, but the, all the sales that will come from today. Food safety in regards to seconds, that goes right back to the damaged if it's damaged or bruised or diseased, then you have a food safety issue, and those are not seconds. Those are garbage. A second means it's cosmetically imperfect, and that's not a food safety issue. So that food safety issue only comes in when they're damaged or diseased. Knowing who your customer is is very important on this grading issue. You know, are there good resources to see pictures of standards? The USDA um, website has um, standards. And I'm going to be in, I know a, a number of you are in Iowa. I'm going to be in Iowa on March 8th 
you know, post harvest handling, food safety work training for five hours. And participants will receive a copy of this wholesale success manual from familyfarm.org for free. It's a $70 manual and has a lot of pictures that will be very helpful. Two little brown beads on that broccoli. It's not that good. Um, back to the sorting. That first question I would ask that broccoli is how long is it going to last? Is it diseased? Are those little brown spots rotten or are they just a little bit dried out? So I would determine how long it's going to last. Is it going to hold up? Is it going to spoil? It just doesn't. It's not even a second. It rots. If those little brown beads are just a little dried up and the whole head as a whole looks great, then it's just fine. And again, a lot of this is going to be down to between you and your customer. You might have a customer that says, I can't get it. Please send it. One year, our cabbage got away on us, and they were literally every single cabbage was 15 pounds each. And nobody wants a 15-pound cabbage. Normally, I could have sold those cabbages to a grocery store. I could have sold them to an institution or a processor or a restaurant. But fortunately for me, there were no organic cabbages in the market that year. And I was able to sell them to stores. And they were cutting in pieces and wrapping them. And we were able to sell them. Um, you may have a customer who is really committed to your farm or to your product, being organic or local, and they can't get another product, and they're willing to accept some cosmetic imperfections. I find that generally, once you get into a grocery store or into a market where you are not selling directly to the buyer, then those things really become difficult to set a second in. This picture I have here of cucumbers, the two yellow ones on the top, those are yellow and mature. And that's actually how the mung market prefers them um, in comparison to the younger green ones. But the mainstream market in the United States is going to prefer those green ones. Some people have the thinking that they should put those yellow ones in there and that everyone can get what they like. But what tends to happen in a grocery store is those yellow ones end up sitting there and affect the sales altogether and cause it to be um, a detriment. So they really shouldn't be put in there. It's a funny thing. People think they don't care that much how things look, but they really do. And when you watch them buy, you will see they go right after the most beautiful ones. If you're selling to a grocery store, that consistent image and quality is really going to be what keeps you in the store and keeps them committed to you. An interesting thing that I have been finding lately is that with this whole farmer hero thing, you know, in the 80s, I never imagined that farmers would be heroes. We were still sort of young of the barn. But now, with the concept that stores are so grateful to, and buyers have this concept of farmers wanting to show appreciation, they often don't let us know or farmers know when there is a problem. So it's going to be very important that you go to your buyers and ask them how you're doing and if there are ways you can improve, if your pack out is good, if they're pleased with when you're delivering, what do you how it's working for them. You need to ask them that, encourage them to communicate problems or concerns so that they will tell you. I find that if we don't ask them that as farmers, oftentimes if they're not satisfied, they won't necessarily communicate it and it can cause a loss of um, relationship. They might just stop buying. So it's very important to have those conversations. So if you can really ask yourself how you can get the crop to that customer the way they like it. We've talked about some of the value additions that you can add. And it's going to be different for every single market you have. So you want it to be customer driven based on who that customer is. This picture I put on this slide, you can see these potatoes in a cardboard pint container, which is not traditional in a grocery store. It is traditional at a farmer's market. That's pretty commonly done at a farmer's market. But 
it just wasn't working in this store. When I took the picture, I noticed the potatoes were green. I asked the buyer about them, and they told me that they weren't selling well, but they left their grower, and they didn't really want to complain. Um, but it wasn't working, so that wasn't um, going to work for the buyer or the seller. So it's very important that you are communicating with your buyers and know what they would like. This net bag is an example of something we did one year when we had too many small potatoes. We normally sold our B potatoes in bulk and sold them all just fine that way. But one year we had too many of them and couldn't sell them all in bulk, so we packed them in little net bags with a label and we found that it drastically increased sales. If a vegetable has a little insect damage, on it, you can look at it again and decide whether that insect damage has scarred over and will be um, will keep long. Squash would be a great example. You'll often get a little insect damage where they bite on it and then the squash could sap out and scars over and it's not going to affect its keeping quality. If the insect damage is leaving the skin raw and bleeding, if a bug has buttoned the tomato and you can see raw flesh through it, then that should not be sold at the market at all. It should be left out. So again, leafy greens, kale, chard. You can get away with a little bit of insect damage. Again, I think that is a cosmetic question on those crops. It's not going to affect the keeping quality unless it's really excessive. But if it is excessive, it won't sell well because it won't look good. So if it's a little bit on the edge, fine usually. You're going to have to look at it and make a judgment call. A lot of this is judgment call and the customer is going to be making that judgment call too. So the bottom line is you want to be able to look back at that produce and say, wow, that's really beautiful. If you can't do that because of drought or whatever thing, you're going to have to really talk to your customer and ask them, what else is available and how that's going to affect you. If I was a produce buyer and I was being offered product that was inferior to other products I could buy, I would be in the position of having to meet my customer's needs. So it's kind of a chain of customers. If you think of a buyer in a grocery store, for example, their job is to make their customer happy and your job is to make your customer who's the buyer of that store happy. So some of these things you're going to be able to make decisions in that pack shed and some of them you may have to speak to your buyer about them. I put these pictures in here because I wanted to show you some value added um, options, especially for small farms. Anytime people are used to buying something for like example like potatoes are often sold in a five pound unit. So if you can sell them in that same way, it's going to really increase how much of it you can sell. These are examples where putting them in a packaging really increases its value. These little tiny apples are selling for $4 for a one pound bag. If they were in bulk, they um, would never have gotten that kind of price and they wouldn't sell that much. When you're packing produce, back to that question of, you know, should it be packed or not, the question really is not would you eat it, but would you buy it? And how long it's going to hold up in a store, or how long it's going to hold up in people's refrigerators. Some supplies that you will need, um, if you're selling wholesale, you're going to need the right type of carton for that produce item. So it's important that you know what that is. Tomatoes, for example, if you were growing heirloom tomatoes, you would really want to have a one layer tomato carton. If you were growing a standard tomato, you could handle a two layer tomato carton. Something like greens, fresh greens, you would want to have a piece of wax paper over and underneath the greens. If you're growing root crops or salad greens, you're going to need plastic liners. 
Alyssa suppliers, Monte packaging is good. I just have a list here right now that would be a good thing to do. I'd be happy to send one out if um, a list, if Luke has a list of your emails. I just put a list together for something else that I'm doing. Just send a list of suppliers out for packaging. I also just put together a list of recommended standardized packs that I can send um, to Luke. He can send that out to you. If you look at these clamshells, you can see how simply packaging those sweet baby peppers in some kind of a unit really increases the value. If you sold those in bulk, you would sell a lot less of them. People just don't pick up on them. So the market has really changed. In the 90s, we were still sending crops to market in an open plastic pint, like these cherry tomatoes on the bottom. That's still common practice at a farmer's market, but that would be a hard sell for most grocery stores. Some might be willing to work with you on that. It's hard for the customer to put in their cart and get it through the line and home without spilling them. They often want a clamshell. I've been very fussy or careful about what I will clamshell and what I won't. Um, something like a berry, it really makes a huge difference. It's going to be hard to take, take a berry home if it's not in a clamshell and keep it from getting damaged. Something like this tomato. Um, for example, I was asked by a buyer if I would grow a, every tomato in exactly six ounces so they could put them in these plastic packages, and I said, no, I didn't want to do that. Didn't see any reason why those sorts of tomatoes needed to be in a clamshell, and I didn't want to increase the plastic use. For a crop like a basil or an herb, it really does make a big difference in the keeping quality and it will also really increase the sales. It also gives you a great chance to put a label on that product and use that for your branding. There are good places where small growers can buy without buying 5,000 of an item, so I will add that to that, make sure that's on there. These um, herbs are a great example of how, you know, with the exception of parsley and basil and cilantro, the other herbs they will sell a lot more herbs if they're in a clamshell, and they will actually keep a lot longer. Um, what a lot of farms do is they will have a generic label printed that has their farm name on it and their contact information, as I'm showing here on the upper right. And then they will buy a label printer, and it will print some of the other information, such as the product name or the volume or the lot number. It could also be written on by hand, so depending on what kind of volume you have, you can write those by hand or you can get one of these label printers. They start at around $500, so that gives you a sense of how much product you're going to need to be able to um, handle one of them. This is a great example of value added. This is from Harmony Valley Farm near Viroqua, Wisconsin. And they're making these soup mix packs. You can see it's just a plastic Ziploc bag that they've had printed. Now, they have printed directly on this bag, which would be expensive. You would have to do a volume to make it work. But you could also have a printer that you print it on, or you could have a handwritten label, or you could print smaller amounts on your um, computer. But um, when you look at this, they really planned this well, the ingredients. They're not even having to commit to set ingredients. It contains five or more of the following seasonal variations. And they list the various vegetables that will be in it, but they're able to adjust the amount of each vegetable and which vegetables go in it based on what they have. And three pounds for $9.99, that's the retail price. Those vegetables would have sold for $1.50 or less a pound. Yeah, they're getting 333 by simply putting them in a bag and putting their name on it. So it's a great example of simple value added that can really um, increase your bottom line and your profit. Here's an example of baking carrots. These are actually videos, and I forgot they wouldn't work for you. Some keepy produce have got these great little tip scales 
you can see that metal there where he's putting the carrots is actually the tip when it's full and so the bay. Here's an example too from Harmony Valley where they're filling uh, arugula into a plastic bag. So these sorts of packs can really be a great value added and not take a substantial amount of time. Here I can see that they did put a place of uh, printed label on rather than having the bags pre-printed. It's going to be less expensive. And then here's an example of buying net in a roll instead of individual nets and she's cutting those nets to the length she wants and she'll tie the bottom of the net bag and she's filling the onions into a plastic container to weigh them and then she'll pour this right into that net. So it could be pretty simple. I put this in here because it's just the next step up in value added. This is not something you can do without a licensed kitchen because it is processed food. You're actually cutting the product. So it would require a licensed kitchen. So this butternut squash was selling for $6 for one pound. This was a local pack done here in St. Paul. So they're getting about five times the dollar per pound by um, paying for it by cutting it up. And again, another example of that. And speak to retail price versus wholesale price for the farm. When we sold to the Twin City Co-ops, they generally had a markup of around 50 to 60 percent. Mainstream grocers generally have a slightly smaller markup. I found in our market, because we received uh, organic premium and because we had committed buyers, we actually could get a higher price in our organic wholesale market than we could get consistently at our roadside stand. So some crops we could get a higher price at a roadside stand like sweet corn was higher. Um, but tomatoes, I couldn't get a higher price at my roadside stand. I actually got a higher price wholesale. Cabbage was higher wholesale. So it would depend on that product and on the market. I definitely found I got higher prices wholesale than I did at the farmer's markets in the Twin Cities. I think that was probably an unusual example compared to most of the markets in the country because the organic market is at this point very well developed in the Twin Cities. But it's important to remember that it wasn't always like that. In the 70s and 80s, there wasn't a premium and it took educating that market consistently to get those higher prices. You don't need a processing license um, for the soup mix because the vegetables are not cut. It's when the vegetables have been cut or altered that you need um, to go through processing licenses and regulations. So this example of butternut squash or this example of coleslaw, you would need to be licensed in a licensed kitchen. But for these um, vegetables in the soup mix, that's just putting product in a bag, baking product, does not require anything different than um, packing your product in your box. How I price a product to a wholesale market. I myself found that I started by asking them what they considered to be a fair price. At the point that I asked them that, I already knew my point, my um, cost of production. So I wasn't going in and just asking that question and then saying, great, I'll take it. I want to know my cost of production. So for me, we were a production oriented farm. And so I wanted a price that would be fair to the customer. Um, a premium is fine, but I wanted to also get some value. So we were probably in general around 60% higher than non-organic produce in our market. But we never played the um, national price game. We came in at our price and we held it there. So we had a committed buyer. Now if you are selling to a market that is also selling non-organic and they're side by side, then you've got a really 
much more challenging situation because that price will become that much more important. And it's important to be able to recognize that you've got a couple of questions going on there. One is that you want to recognize whether you're making your money on um, having sufficient volume so you don't need to make as much per item, but it's a buyer that's going to be able to move a lot of volume and you will be profitable because you're selling volume and you can have that economic viability. It's just that much more viable when you reach a certain scale. A good example would be to plant a crop. For us, it takes a certain amount of time to set everything up, to get the plants ready, to get everything out to the field, the tractors, the equipment, the water, everything, to get the people out there to plant. Once we're up and going, if we want to put in an extra 1,000 or 2,000 plants, that really doesn't take us that much longer because it's mechanized. So we can plant 3,000 plants an hour. If we want to plant an extra 1,500 plants, it's only an extra half an hour. And we see those same economies of scale in the harvest season. Once everybody's out there picking, if we want to pick an extra 10 boxes, it doesn't take that long. So. That's really an important part of that pricing scheme and when you look at that cost of production. So matching that customer up with what you can do. If you've got a really small market and you're in markets where there's your product against non-organic product or non-local product and you're not able to differentiate in any way because you're not certified or because you're just not in a market that is ready to pay for that value yet. You're going to have to really be sure you're matching your volume with the price that you want it to move at. Obviously, if you raise your price um, above a certain price point, you're going to price yourself out of the market. Oftentimes, I'll ask our buyer how it will move at various prices. I might ask them what they see as a fair price. I might ask them, um, well, I'd like to get a little more for that. How will it move, do you think, at X price? And if you have a good relationship with them, they'll have a good sense and they'll tell you that it'll affect sales a lot, it'll affect sales a little. Any buyer with any experience should have a good sense of what their customers will bear. And then you're going to really have to decide at a point whether it's profitable or not. And knowing that cost of production it's going to be a really important part of being able to figure that out. Sometimes it is worth hanging in a market that's not profitable. If you feel, you believe, you can see that that's going to change, it's a matter of educating them, and then it's going to get better. Sometimes it's not going to get better, and you have to just cut your losses or treat a buyer as um, surplus only and not expect them to really become a main buyer. I wanted to show you another picture here, I think. There are some buyers that are going to require a PLU number. It's these five digit numbers on the bottom here. And you can get these stickers generic. Omira Printing will have them. Anytime you want to get printed materials, those you can pretty much get anywhere. But there's also great supplies of um, pre-printed materials. Your state may have a locally grown program and have some of these labeled materials. If your buyer requires a PLU number, it is a lot of work to put those on. And if I could avoid it, I would. But if you're selling to a store that also sells product, different um, lines of the same type of product, they may need to differentiate it. You can also buy a little price done like the one on the top right here. And that'll, that way you can adjust it and you wouldn't have to buy a lot of different stickers. But think about how you can bring in this kind of labeling, again, to brand yourself, whether it's through a rubber band, anything that can tell your story, who you are, how you're different, all those sorts of things that can be very helpful, people knowing who you are. What other questions do we have that people have I want to talk about yet?
I think farmers markets can be very challenging for farmers when there is that level of heavy competition. If you're at a farmer's market and you can find a way to differentiate yourself, what has worked um, in Minneapolis for some farmers is when they've been able to bring in crops that have a like a unique twist, or they can do um, become known for a certain crop. One thing we did with our watermelons that really was quite helpful and really helped brand the farm and get people to know the melons was besides putting our farm sticker, our logo sticker on it, we had stickers of different colors, red, orange, and yellow. The melons looked very similar from the outside, and so people would have trouble telling the different colors apart, and we would put those stickers on it. That way, they could really see from the outside what the color of the flesh was going to be, and they really liked that. It also brought a real like image to them of that farm's melons, and they really related to it and would remember it. How do you know when it's time to make a jump to a new kind of packaging? How can we make the decision knowing that upfront costs will pay off? Are you referring to carton packaging or labeling? What kind of package are you referring to? In general, um, for something like a carton package, you know, the box package, there, you're really, it's important if you're selling to a retailer that you're sending the product in a box that works for them. Those boxes have to be strong enough that the product will be protected. They have to be um, stackable. They have to be the right type of box for that product. If you're looking at individual packaging, again, try to start small and develop your market at a small scale so that you know what these things cost. If you're starting out small, try to use labels that you're going to be able to be generic with. We never purchased a lot of uh, pre-printed labels. We had our logo, the Garden of Eden logo, that was a sticker. So we had a one-inch sticker. And we could put that onto um, labels and make our own. So for something like we had this green sticker that went on our box, and then we would just use that to um, make a sticker with our logo when we just needed something like folded in half. When we had some potatoes um, that we were selling in little nut bags, I mentioned those a little earlier. Again, I found a way to do it that was really viable. I had these little nut bags that you see here. And I just made a little label that I had printed um, at Kinko's. It wasn't terribly expensive. I maybe made a thousand of them, knowing that I was going to definitely sell that many, and we just folded them over and stapled them on there. So they don't necessarily have to be terribly expensive. By having a little Garden Vegan logo sticker, that was something I did invest the money into. It was a four-color sticker, but it was just so versatile. So try to make labels that you can use for a lot of different things um, when you're small. I wouldn't do something like this bag, for example, until I knew that I had really sufficient volume. Or like these printed apple bags, I would not, I would use a generic bag and I would put on my own label until I really had sufficient volume. A label like this one on the right could actually be printed pretty economically with a label printer. If I was doing a fair amount of prepackaged stuff, I would purchase one of those label printers. At what scale does wholesale become more possible profitable? Wholesale, you're going to have to look at um, if you're getting a premium or not. If you're getting a premium because you're organic, um, then it's that much more profitable. If you're playing that national market and you're not necessarily getting a premium, it's really going to require volume and mechanization to make it profitable. I really encourage you to go to that enterprise tool that I showed you earlier that's on the Iowa State website, and you'll find that it's pretty simple to plug in your numbers and compare a crop 
that you may be growing right now at a small scale, you'll have the numbers already from your own production. And you can put in a hypothetical numbers to see what it would look like at a larger production. Then you'll be able to see if you can afford the equipment and the other inputs that it would take to scale that up. That, and those enterprise tools are hard to find on the Iowa website. If you go to my website, atinadipley.com, there is a farmer resource page, and those enterprise budgets are linked from there. And I think we are about out of time. That's right. I just wanted to jump in and say a couple of words. Yeah, I'll just say a couple things. Uh, if you want to attend our annual conference, Practical Farms of Iowa's annual conference, 10th, 11th, and 12th of January, you can still register for a great discount so before much. January 2nd. My website again is Atina Diffley, that's A-T-I-N-A-D-I-F-F-L-E-Y dot com. And there's a farmer resource page. It has a lot of links on it, post-harvest handling, and to this enterprise tool, um, links from all different categories. And this wholesale success manual that I mentioned earlier is the manual from familyfarm.org that I just revised and it's focused on wholesale and post harvest handling and food safety. And I'll be in Iowa and in Wisconsin. If you go to the familyfarm.org website, you can see the schedule. I'll be in 25 cities this winter giving that workshop. Thank you very much, Atina. Thank you for your preparation. I wanted to jump in and say one thing, and that is thank you to our sponsors who would make it possible to pay folks like Atina for doing such a great job sharing their experience, including the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program and a bunch of other great funders there on the screen in the lower right. If you're a beginning farmer looking to save some money for the, to attend the annual conference, we've got members in Story County who would like to host you at a home, as a homestay, a free homestay at their home uh, so you can you can take off that lodging expense uh, to attend the annual conference, and we'd sure love to have you. So let me know, and we'd be happy to work with you. Atina, thanks for your work tonight, and I do appreciate uh, all the great ideas you shared with us.